So today, the theme is, again, children who are angry with their fathers. That's what he gave me and to do a time of uh, teaching. And uh, so I'm going to turn your attention again to the book of Ephesians chapter 6. Today we'll do two main scriptures. When you found Ephesians 6, please uh, uh, let's stand together. <coughs> We'll read responsibly again. Verse 1 says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. That it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Amen. And now I want you to turn to the book of Colossians, chapter 3. When you're there, say amen. Verse 20, I'll read that, and then 21, we'll read it together. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. Amen. Praise God. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. For your word is right by itself. It's been tested and tried, purified seven times according to your word. So we know that it's right. We know that it'll stand the test of time, circumstances, and everything. It's truth. And truth will always prevail. And so we pray now, Lord God, that our hearts and minds and everything about us would uh, begin to strive to line up with truth. That it may be well with us as well. In Jesus' precious name, take control. Have your way. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. God bless you. You may be seated. I don't have any problem with... Uh, my children, I was going to tell them, I don't have any problem if, you know, I know that there's some areas where I have grown, but if you feel in the Lord ministering to you where you've been hurt, I have no problem with my children coming to the altar and getting help. Because it's not about me now, right? It's about what the Lord is saying. He wants to heal uh, children who are angry with their fathers. All right, so that's the theme. And we said on last week that there were several types of fathers that we will be talking about uh, during these messages. One is fathers that abused their children to fathers that abuse their mothers, the children's mothers. Three, fathers that abandon altogether their children. Four, fathers that neglects their children. I think that's one of them. What was that no more time? Yes, children that thank you, neglect and don't provide for the families. Number five, children, I mean fathers that didn't keep their promise or they broke promises. Then number six, fathers that are too strict and making it, making the children feel like they can't please them, unpleasable fathers. And then the last one is fathers that are passive, weak, won't be the men that they're called to be. All of these areas among, I'm sure there are many others, but those are the ones that he gave me to talk about. And so with the help of God, we'll do our dearest to talk about it and emphasize the things that God has in mind. So that um, 
you know, we can receive from him. Um, looking at the role of fathers, Malachi 4, 5 and 6 talks about uh, he was going to turn the hearts. Uh, he's going to send Elijah before the that day of the Lord comes and he's going to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers. Uh, lest he smite the earth with a curse. So it's very important to God that there be a relationship and a wholesome relationship between fathers and children. And <clears throat> uh, But the interesting thing is that lest I come and smite the earth. So in God's mind, the fathers had a very grave responsibilities. And we just read Ephesians and we just read Colossians. So fathers are to educate their children. They are to train them in right paths. They are to teach them about God and teach them about what's right, what's wrong, good and evil, God and Satan, life in general, so that they can be somewhat prepared to meet the challenges that they will face in life. And trust me, everyone will face challenges. And you cannot know beforehand all the challenges that you face, but they're there. And as we fathers do our best to please God and then to educate and train our children in right paths, then God will take that from there when they're adults and go on and take them higher and teach them other things that's very important for life. And um, I looked at the book of Proverbs and I see Solomon saying things about my son. Don't forget my law, but let your heart keep my word. Just you can go to Proverbs chapter 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and they're all saying, my son, do this, my son, do this. Keep my word. Get wisdom. He's talking about life and God. And so what the Bible has to say is very, very important to function and to have the best in life according to what God wills for each life. And <clears throat> so there were there were there is uh, Abraham found in Genesis 18. God said, uh, shall I hide this thing from Abraham? For I know him, that he will basically be a model and example and command his household after him so that I might bring upon him the vision and the promise that I've promised him. It was important for him because it may start with him, but it, it would go years and years, decades, scores, and centuries down the road before he would fulfill the total plan of God that he promised Abraham. So it was very important for Abraham to teach his son, sons and on down the line. We know that we don't have uh, 2,000 years before the Lord come. But then there was plenty of time, but it's still important that we teach our children how to live according to what is right in the sight of God. Uh, there's a lot of evil in the world, and to know how to somewhat navigate through this world with instructions in life is very, very important. And then we look at Job, how Job prayed for his children. So that's another thing. Fathers are to not only train, educate, be a model, but to pray for their children or his children. And then also we find in Joshua the same thing. Joshua said, choose you this day 
who you will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So Joshua was the instructor and the leader of his family. He understood what was right in God's sight. And he was determined to teach and educate his children so that they could in turn do the same and pass it on and the generations to come. That's how God sees things. He doesn't just see one uh, 20 or 40 years span of a, or 60 years of a generation. He sees way down the road. He sees a line, a lineage, a tribe. And that's how God functions. So it requires a lot of unselfishness on our part as fathers to see the big picture and not allow like so many have uh, in society been very selfish and make things all about them and they brought abuse on their children and their spouses and to say the least. But we're glad that God takes up the pieces and uh, he compensates when we come to him and do find the truth. Also, um, again, the theme today is what we'll be talking about for a few weeks. Children that are, who are angry with their fathers. Let's look at the, a little bit about the abnormal use of a father. Because the word abuse is basically means abnormal use. We can look at when fathers do not serve the role as they should, then they have abused or taught their children abnormal use. And what uh, came to me is that Many times they struggle to find meaning and purpose in life when they have been abused. So we're talking about the fathers in this session, the fathers that abuse their children. Fathers that abuse their children. Abuse, abnormal use, means to use for a bad purpose or a bad effect, to misuse. And sometimes that involves cruel or violent treatment. Normal use and proper training. Children need love and respect, affirmation and support, protection, provision, education and training. Children need that from their fathers. So as fathers, we must always be teaching and training, educating and modeling what's right in the sight of God. Um, continuous criticisms and rebuke, discipline that diminishes rather than a firm self word breaks the spirit of a person. And that's what should be guarded with all diligence, excuse me. From we as fathers. I, I've made some mistakes. I'm not proud of them, but I have made some mistakes in my service to the Lord and God he didn't treat it lightly. The thing I like about God is he's a very just God. He doesn't play favorites. He doesn't take sides. When you make a mistake, he will definitely come to you and teach you. And so we can learn if we are teachable. Isn't that right? Yeah, so um, I'll not stand before you and tell you I did everything. Right, there's a lot of things that I did that um, was not the wisest thing to do. Uh, I 
been striving to do what's right. But, you know, when you start out, you see through colored lens. You're seeing through your experiences and your attitudes and uh, your images. And so God has to work on clearing up those distorted images of God and concepts that are faulty. He, he has to uh, work and help you see truth so that all of this stuff can uh, uh, be set aside and you can come into a clearer picture of what life is supposed to be like with God and depending on your gender, in this case, fathers. So um, it is a constant learning process. I am happy and excited to have learned the little that I've learned and happy to share that with others. Uh, I said it before, there are, I could count the times on my hand when my father came and sat down to instruct me. Very, very few. But of those times, the few that he spoke, those words, I can tell you today what they were. They meant a lot to me. Because he was a godly man, they meant a lot to me. I saw his life modeled, but the times that he said to me, thus and so, it's just precious. I took his advice. I remember one time I was working two jobs, eight hours in the day, eight hours in the evening, newly married. Dad came up to visit me. I was living in Greensboro. And off the weekend, I was off. And he said to me, son, I'm not trying to run your life. I'm not trying to tell you what to do. He said, but get your job so that you can be home with your family at night. He didn't get into a lot of Things he says, I'm older than you, and I know what I'm saying. Well, I worked for a couple more weeks, and I let that night job go. Fathers that will give sound godly wisdom can save their sons and daughters of a lot of headaches. God is good he, to give fathers. It is so important, so I hope that uh, uh, even if you haven't had a father that spoken to your life, I hope that these series can mean something to you. Well, this is God's intent. So, um, <clears throat> just don't mind if I take my time. I'm not going to rush through this. <clears throat> Training is more than just teaching and, and learning facts. It's the formation of a person. And sometimes that involves discipline. Isn't that right? It's a forming, it's a shaping a person. And that does not come with just teaching and given knowledge alone. The father must teach by precept and example. It's not enough to teach a person to do what I say, don't do what I do. It's sufficient to say, follow me as I follow him. Isn't that right? And that's what God looks for. Don't ever teach someone to do something that you wouldn't do. So important in life. In the outcome, God is responsible for the outcome if it's good, right? He's a good God. So we look now again back at the scripture, Ephesians chapter 6, 4. They say that during that time, the Greco Romans and the Romans, the society of that day, Paul, that he was quite familiar with. Fathers had absolute authority. And if they did not 
uh, find true usefulness with the father, the daughter, or the son. You could dispose of them altogether. And uh, abortion was practiced during that time as well. And um, and especially women, fathers, they could do that. Uh, 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 girls, the daughters. And Paul speaking to that kind of um, cultural, saying, "Fathers, don't provoke your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. Bring them up in the fear and the admonition of God." And uh, then he said, children, obey your parents in the Lord. This is right. And he gave the importance of it. There is a promise that goes along with those instructions. And it, it holds dear to today. Some have argued that he didn't, long life is not necessarily one of those things today. Under the law, they talked about long life. But I, I have you to know that I believe long life is still good uh, when you do right today, isn't it right? Yeah, and <clears throat> uh, just to briefly list, I uh, list some normal effects of fatherly abuse. And uh, bear with me; uh, these are some things that the Lord, by His Spirit, did. I'm going to be um, recording these in a book, and hopefully, before the years, I can get that um, in a couple of books. Here, He's been really speaking to me a lot about these things that he's revealed to me to make sure I write them down and put them in book form so they can be passed on. And So uh, I kind of drug my feet on this, but uh, open confession is good kind of for the soul. <laughs> but I can't do it any longer. I must be diligent about what he gives. And I'm finding that if you're diligent about the little things he gives you, he'll give you more. So if you drag your feet about a little, few, the little things, then don't be praying for no big things, isn't that right? <laughs> because God looks at the little things that you do when he gives you a small assignment. And when you know that God is speaking, and, uh, don't revel in the fact that God spoke to me. God spoke to me. God spoke to me. God spoke to me. The question is, did you obey it? If not, shh. Isn't that right? <laughs> Amen. So, these are some things. This is what he said. And, and, and probably most of them, if not all, you, you, you've heard it, you know that. But I'm still going to give it because that's what I felt. He spoke to me and, and to reiterate. Fathers that abuse their children can create fear of getting close in relationships. It can create distrust. Fathers that abuse their children, this is, we're talking fathers that abuse now. There's physical abuse, there's verbal abuse, there's sexual abuse, but abuse, right? And in these categories, it may vary because we're talking about abuse as a whole and but generally speaking he says it can create fear of getting close in relationships people are afraid to get close to others or fear of others seeing things about them that they don't like so they will always keep a certain distance in any relationship and especially Sometimes even in the husband and wife relationship, one may be afraid to really fully surrender um, to that spouse. Fear of getting close. Second thing he said, they fear submission to the husband or they may have a hard time submitting to their husbands, the women that have been abused by their fathers may find it hard to submit to their husbands. Third thing he said was can cause distorted images of God. Of course, we said creating distrust in relationship with Him, but 
can cause distorted relationships or images of God. They see God like they see their fathers. If their fathers was abusive, then they're afraid. Then in their head, they may really desire to know God more, to serve him, but somewhere in the heart of hearts where the love receptors have been damaged, they are afraid to get very close to God because they may feel that God is, will abuse them. This is what the Holy Spirit gave me now. So it can create distorted images of God. God is too big for my situation. He's not concerned about this little petty thing that I'm struggling with. So they may struggle and feel guilty for asking God to help them in situations where they really need help because of abuse. And then, fourth thing he mentioned, it can create, it can create anxieties, worries, insecurities, issues with the children. Talk with some not too long ago, some person shared, I don't know how to overcome just these worries. I just, I'm a worrier. And I don't understand why. Well, I'm giving you some truth today. Fathers that abuse their children cause them, can, the abuse can create anxieties words, insecurities, they can be severe issues, but God, but God wants to make the difference, but God wants to make the difference. So you see saints, it's not just you know, we come to church and we can rejoice before God, but it's much bigger than that. So much bigger than that. God wants to heal us where we have been born in sin, shapen in iniquity. I, I have you, I mean, have had, um, you call this clay, played with clay, where you, and play dough as well, yeah. But I was talking basically about the regular clay, modeling clay, where you take it and you just use it, and you know, you can shape and make little things out of it. Well, sin had the big hand and it fashioned us. Are you with me? So we were all shaped in sin. We learned the wrong ways of doing things. So that's what David said in Psalm. We were, David said, I was born in sin, and, 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 and it was when God caught him in adultery and began to deal with him, right? And then he had to confess, God forgive me. You know, I, I was born in sin. And the hand of sin fashioned me. So all the areas I haven't overcome yet. And I didn't, I hadn't learned to overcome that lust yet, and so it kind of got me. Forgive me, Lord, he said. He said, to him, and he went on to say, you desire truth in the inward parts. Are you hearing me? All the parts of our hearts where there's iniquity, God is saying, I want truth in the inward parts. You know, where nobody sees I want truth there. 
because eventually it catches up with us. So the good thing about God is he's saying, I'm addressing the needs of children who are angry with their fathers. He's saying, I'm going to a root problem that a lot of people have not literally owned up to and allowed me to really get the root of this problem that has caused all kinds of anxieties and stress, insecurities, to mention a few. Isn't that a good God? Wow. So you mean that I can't look at my brother or sister and say, you the cause. They're not the cause. Then he says, number five, it can create issues of control. You all probably don't know people like that, but at least bear with me. I'm trying to give all that he gave, and I hope it's not too much right now, but he said it can create issues of control. Sometimes a person that's been abused, they have a real struggle when you take them out of control. They have to be in control. They're afraid of being controlled. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Number six. He said, fathers that abuse their children can create a sense of serving God out of fear more than out of a loving relationship. They get into legalism. They get into legalism. So they don't have real peace. There's a lot of fear in their service. How do you know? I've been there. I know. And I remember the Lord spoke to me in the 80s. And he said, son, and I mean, he was blessing me too. I mean, he was really blessing me, I, uh, blessing me spiritually. And then so when I came to pastor, he waited just as nice until I came over to pastor and got me away from the ministry that I was under. And um, he said to son, he said, you've been serving me out of a fear. He says, I don't want you to serve me like that. He said, I want you to serve me out of a loving relationship. I couldn't do that because I didn't know that kind of God. I just felt like if I didn't do it, then bad things are just going to happen to me. So I did it. I did love God, but I did it primarily because I was afraid of the consequences. And the Lord said, I don't want you to serve me like that. Yes, you must have a reverential awe of God, but I'm a father, and I'm the best father a person could ever have. And I love you with an everlasting love. I don't love you for what you can do for me. I love you because you need love. I love you because I am love. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Well, I, needless to say, I didn't know anybody like that other than my mother. <laughs> I wasn't sure that my father was like that, but I'm sure he had, uh, you know, love for me. It's just that he was hurt too. But I'm saying this to say fathers that abuse their children can cause and create certain things. And God wants to help us today. He's a good God, isn't he? And then he says, 
it can lower tremendously self's worth, self esteem. Fathers, fathers have a grave responsibility. I, I look at the little that I've learned, and I look at sometimes when I hear about fathers walking away and never looking back, never reaching out to their children, their sons or daughters. I understand now better that they just didn't know any better. Perhaps their fathers never taught them. So they just kept doing what they knew and saw. But we're in a different day now. And I am so grateful for the opportunity to share truth to a society that has made these things, uh, made the life of sin and abandonment just like second nature. But we've been called to speak truth. God will hold us responsible if we don't speak truth. Share the light. Tell somebody, this is the way. Walk in this way. This is what God is requiring. And so that there may be a father out there that says, well, nobody taught me. I didn't know that I had to answer to God. I didn't know that this was the right way. All I saw all my life down through several generations was this. And even if I knew better, it seemed like I couldn't do any better. But God says, you can because I will heal you and I'll break that old curse that was upon your fathers and your grandfathers and your ancestors. He will make us new. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Fathers that abuse their children. And he further goes on to say they create dark images causing them to form concepts that are faulty. Images, dark images. That's why when we get saved, God strongly encourages us to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Because you can be saved and with a mind unrenewed, be more familiar with the old life and live just like you're not saved. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? And God knows that. So he says in order to change and walk in a changed nature, there has to be a renewing of the thought life, the things that you know to be true so that the mind, the mind is key in that process, as uh, Toyko Toy, you said earlier, the mind. And who knows that better than Satan? He knows that. So he comes when he want to stop you and I, he comes to the mind. Because he knows he doesn't have a living chance if he cannot convince us through the mind. So he goes to the mind. This brother ain't about nothing. This sister ain't about nothing. They're trying to do you in. They're trying to hurt you. God doesn't speak like that. That's not the voice of God. For the devil is the accuser of the brethren. Isn't that right? But if our mind have not been renewed, we don't know this. We follow the dictates of the flesh. God says he wants us to walk now in the spirit of that which we've been born again. Isn't that right? Being renewed. So he says it creates dark images 
causing them to form concepts, ideas and ways of thinking that are faulty. Let me tell you, I remember years ago, I, my mind, just, 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 just trust issues, mind, thoughts. It was always thinking negative about this and that and the other. And I remember uh, there in the, by the restroom and in the mirror just talking, just, just uh, there and why those thoughts was playing on my mind. And God said, those are evil concepts. And he said, and you must renounce those evil concepts. Just thoughts. But they were evil. They were evil. Always thinking the worst and not, not thinking the best about someone. I share where I've been where God has taught me with hope that somebody uh, that if you are there you can get the help that he's been helping me with. And Satan comes he big time he does that to uh, divide and hurt people but God's not in that. Isn't that right? I'm so glad he's not in that. So Creates dark images, causing people to form ideas or ways of thinking that's not wholesome. Then he said, it opens them up to Satan's lies based on those images and concepts and experiences. So Satan takes advantage of those evil thoughts. Have you ever had a situation where someone... Something happened and you, you felt that it was uh, targeted at you and you just kept embracing it and pondering it, pondering it. And the more you thought about it, the worse the thoughts got. Have anybody ever been there? It's real. But the images will cause that to happen. And so the images, they don't just go away. First of all, there has to be truth. And that's where the word comes in, right? So uh, uh, when I know the truth, God can take now and by his Holy Spirit, because the spirit follows the word, right? So when truth comes, then God can take and heal where I've been hurt. Because now I know the truth and I know what's been happening to my mind is a lie. So if I'm going to overcome that, I have to have the knowledge of truth. If God says the devil is the accuser of the brethren, I can't justify my accusations. Are you hearing what I'm saying? They're never justified. No matter how I feel, they're not justified. So I have to learn truth. And so God goes to the root of my problem, which could be anger. Uh, Y'all got to hear what I'm trying to say. So he has to go to the root of my problem and where these images and concepts have been formed, making me think that way. The good thing that I love about God is he does not say, oh, you rascal, you, you, you. God doesn't do that comes and says I want to show you why you have these struggles in your mind and I want to heal you I know what happened 10, 15, 20, 30 years ago I know what happened and I know what it's been causing to your life but I've got good news I came to heal you and make you whole. Hallelujah. 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 Glory to God. And then he says, it creates unhealthy thought patterns influenced by demon spirits. Unhealthy thought patterns. I've talked to many over the years, many, some were old and some were young, the thought patterns, just, just that. Sometimes the thoughts, just, just you know, the pattern of those thoughts, they can be just going in ordinary life in those, you know, in a zone there because of, Demons taking advantage of 
and things that happen. And then it can create unhealthy thought patterns that's influenced by demons. All right. And then he says this. I'm, I'm, I'm giving a lot, but, uh, you, know, I, I, you know, if you desire copies of these, I can have these written down. But we'll be talking a bit over the weeks. And, uh, of course, he said, because abuse is abnormal use, many times a person may struggle to find purpose in life. And I mentioned that earlier. Then finally, or then not next to the last one, is some who have been abused sexually may feel that they are only good for sex. Those things can happen. Number six, some are abused verbally. A dad acts out of his own selfish, childish fears and anger when he hurts the child with either abusive words or physical abuse. Because he's supposed to nurture, teach, protect his child, to be their defender, mentor, and friend. But instead, they don't know any better. How do they abuse? Sometimes yelling and screaming at the child. Sometimes bearing in, I mean, doing insults, an attempt to humiliate or control. And then there are times when a person may experience a violent parent, father in this case, and see them so angry they pick up things and throw. They break furniture. You know, we're living in a society where this happens frequently. Many times, people behind closed doors are hurting. So you and I have a grave responsibility to get this word of God out, to share hope with people. Let people know that you don't have to stay there. Christ died that you might live. Hallelujah. He's there. He'll be there for him. So these are some of the things that God really was speaking to me. Negative side effects. They can affect how they grow and mature negatively. Can affect how she grows and matures negatively after her emotional well-being and development. Decrease of self-worth, low self-esteem, confident, lack of confidence, depression, trust issues, eating disorders, low academic achievement, difficulty maintaining friendship, insomnia, the list can go on. This is healthplace.com. There's so many of these things here that um, I've heard and was familiar with. Some was reiterated to me. But bringing this down to a conclusion, somebody says, I'm, I'm up in the age and why, why bother to change now? Well, what he said was soundness of heart. You want to make the heart sound. Proverbs 14.30 says a sound heart is the life of the flesh. In other words, if that heart is sound, then this body is going to affect the body in a positive way. But if the heart is not sound, then it's going to affect the body in a negative way. So why do it now? Somebody says, I'm 30, I'm 40, I'm 50, I'm 60, I'm 70. I, why bother with it now? I mean, I've... God wants to make the heart sound, he said. Soundness in the heart so that we, and soundness here deals with a yielding heart to mend, to cure, 
to heal, to repair, to bring peace, a peaceful heart. Some people have never known peace. God said to me years ago, he said, if you're going to help people, certain things you need to understand about people. He said, some people have never had peace and they've never had love. You know, when you're trying to help somebody, if you don't know that, you can kind of further exacerbate the situation, right? Just by not knowing. Wholesome. Soundness meaning wholesome. Here's what he kind of brought me down to. He said to make the heart sound. To make the heart sound is to make the heart wholesome. And to make the heart wholesome, it makes for a wholesome speaking. Are you with me? Because the Bible says a wholesome tongue is a tree of life. So this, it's not likely that we can monitor the tongue and words without first Dealing with heart problem. Isn't that right? Amen. You may feel like, God, I'm not going to stop this. I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm not going to speak this negative no more. I'm not going to do this. You may have put forth a wrong, a good, strong effort to do so. But here's what the Lord says today to us. You got to know the starting point. It's the heart. Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Isn't that right? So if there's anger in my heart, I may cover it for a while with nice little sweet words. But don't you, don't, 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 don't push me. Don't get me wrong. You ain't going to like what I say. You know, you know. Y'all follow what I'm saying? <laughs> but a sound heart, a heart that's wholesome, healed, cured, out of that kind of heart when people push you, it ain't going to make you raise up this hand, you know. I had a friend, he just got saved, and he was used to that from the street so they went out to evangelize and he said they went out to evangelize and, and you know it was an open air kind of thing and so there was a guy that was unsaved there and, and while the preacher was talking he said this guy standing near this guy and this guy kept looking at him kind of kept looking at the guy and so you know he's from the streets like okay this guy is up to something here so here he is a Christian new Christian so he was standing there and he kept feeling this thing. The next thing you know, he clenched his fist. He, he's going to knock him out. He's going to knock him out. That's what he was used to. You know? <laughs> but when he clenched his fist, he said to the Holy Spirit, no, don't do that. And he kind of let it go. It takes God to change us, isn't that right? <laughs> God is a good God. He loves us so much. So they, in conclusion... We want to change, but we've got to understand and see it for what it is. God changes the heart. And when the heart changes, it's going to change the way you speak. That's how that goes. You know, I was listening to a testimony by Lee Williams and, and also the Williams brother. They did a song together, he and Melvin. This is an old, older song, but um, um, I kind of like it to hear it. I listen to it a lot. But he was saying about cooling waters. One of the things he said when he went down in the water, I understood what he was trying to say. Went down in the water and he came up saved. Now, you know that you can go in the water if you don't get saved. And confess Christ, you're gonna go wet, go down a wet center, you're gonna come up a wet center, right? But I understood what he was trying to say. He was talking about salvation. So in this salvation, he was saying that I no longer I experienced a change. And uh 
I didn't want to just live any longer. But I, instead, I wanted something that I could give. He had a change in the heart. He said, I have love in my heart now as a result of the change. So when God saves us, immediately we know there's a change, right? But then there's that process of sanctification that is a daily, weekly, monthly, yearly ordeal where God cleanses and get these strongholds, iniquities, angers from our hearts. But I can tell you the little that times that he's healed my heart, oh, I pleaded for more. He says, God, this is so good. Change me. Change me. Heal all you want to. I want to be whole. I want to represent you well. And I believe everyone here today under the sound of my voice truly want to represent God well. I believe that. But I leave you with this. Start. Not everyone here has anger toward their father. I realize that. But some do. Otherwise, God's telling me stuff to teach. And he doesn't know what he's talking about, right? But I got to say, he knows what he's talking about. Isn't that right? Not everybody have that problem, but there's some. But I want you to know, to the some that may struggle with this, God's the answer. And I don't plan to call anybody up. And Now, that's my plan. I don't plan to do it. But one of the things I believe he told me to do was to pray a general prayer and allow him to just minister to the hearts of his people. Is that all right? You see, he can do it much faster and better. And a person can have issues in their heart and they don't have to tell nobody. But they can talk to him. And he can meet them right in their seat. Isn't that right? So we want to give God an opportunity. First of all, that's, that's, I just want to pause and give God some honor and praise. Can you help me? I thank you, Father. I thank you, Father. I bless you. I magnify you. You're so good to us. You are incredible. Oh, God. I cannot find the words to adequately describe your goodness. But I try. I give you thanks. I thank you for the body of Christ that's here today. Lord, I gave what you gave to me. I didn't try to add to it but I gave what you gave to me. You know us, and you can help us. And so I'm so confident that you can help us. So we begin now to pray, and I'm gonna ask you if you will bow your heads, and hallelujah. If you're near someone, I'm call on my wife to come join me in a prayer. If you're near someone, just join hands if you can. Hallelujah. The Lord is able to bring incidents up in your memory to cause you to understand that, yeah, there's some anger there. But He'll heal the memories, He'll do what you can never do. He's a master at what he does. He'll never condemn you. But if you'll open your heart today, he'll begin to mend broken places. Father, I sense your presence right now.
you're in the building and you're in the place here. These are yours, the sheep of your pasture, the flock of God. Take control and minister to us today. You know where we've been, you know. You know what we need. Lord, bring up a memory, let him have his way, let healing come.